Hello everyone, and welcome back to this last video in the eHoudini Academy Foundation Module. That's right, this is the last video of the Foundation Module, and in this video we are going to finish up our project. So if we look at our building right now, it's already working, everything's fine, but as I described in the last video, I wanted to integrate the texturing system in Houdini 19 as well because the Houdini 18.5 version is hard-coded. In this case, I want to create a version that is more flexible and can actually deal with the preview material attribute that we're already providing from all across our network. So if we are asking for a texture from one of our texturing nodes, then at the end of our network, we don't want to have to set it up a second time. We just want it to read that texture and then load it. So that's what we're going to do in this video. But I'm not going to do just that. What we're also going to do is write some additional VEX code inside of these nodes, which is probably the most extensive VEX code that we've written so far, that will check our textures to make sure that they exist. And if they don't exist, we're going to place a default texture on it instead. I want to check against two different things. One, I want to check if the actual file exists on our hard drive, the one that comes from this string. And two, I want to make sure that it's an accepted file extension as well. So if it's trying to load a texture that is not accepted, it will not load it. Now, like I mentioned, this VEX code is going to be the most complex VEX code that we've written up to this point. And in order to debug it, we're also going to include a debug function. And this is going to write out a debug line in our console and will show us if our texture exists and if it's an accepted file type as well. So this will include some debug code and this is useful if your VEX code gets extensive enough uh, in order to find out what's happening inside of your code. Now so far we've used attributes to debug our VEX code like a test attribute for example but we can also output it to the console and actually let the VEX code tell us what it's doing. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And as you might have noticed, I've also built a couple of additional buildings here that are just there to show what the tool is capable of if you use it to its fullest extent. And to close off this project, I will be releasing a new example file for the project which contains all the minor changes that we've made during the project, as well as these textures over here. So I have a new set of textures that come with the new example files. And if you download those, which will be available shortly after this video is released, uh, you'll be able to apply these to the building. Or of course, you can source your own textures if you want to. But this will allow you to experiment a bit, create some nice different looking buildings, so you can be a bit more you know, creative with the tool set and make your own little city. Um, now, I'll be discussing more about the next module at the end of this video. But for now, let's go to our main file. And let's start adding this last system so we can wrap up our tool. I'm going to grab this one and move it over to the side. And then we can start working on the Houdini 19 version of our texturing system next. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this subnet, paste it here on the left, and let's call this one Assign Optimized Quick Shades for Houdini 19. And just to make it stand out, I'll give it a different color as well. Maybe something yellow in this case. Now in here, um, we do need to change this system because the way how we're going to set this up for Houdini 19 is a bit different. First, let me go ahead and remove this node here and all of these nodes down here. We just want to keep one material node around. Next to that, I'm going to rename this one to material one. And I'll explain to you later why. So the way how we're going to make this work is by taking each unique material that we have, putting them in order 
So basically, we have one material, and then once we run out of that one, we have the next, and then the next, and we'll put this in an alphabetical order as well. That's um, simple enough. We can do that with a sort node. Then we're going to run that through a wrangle script, which is going to look at every single primitive on this building in order of the primitive numbers. And it's then going to assign them a value. Basically, the first material is going to get value 1, and then the next material, once it switches over, is going to get value 2, and then we're going to continue until we run out of materials. Okay? So basically, each material will have an index. Then, we're going to set that into a group, a group called material 1, material 2, material 3, etc. So our groups will have a numbered name, which is not the same as before, where we had a group name based on the actual name of the material, but we're just going to give them a number. Let's create a sort node first. And like I mentioned, if we take a sort node and we run it over an attribute, then it's going to sort all of our primitives, in this case, um, by that attribute value. So let's set this sort node over so it sorts by attribute. And then under the attribute value, we can grab one of the attributes available. In this case, I want to grab my preview material name, right, this one. And by doing that, we now have our materials in a alphabetical order, starting with the empty field that we get for our glass. Okay, so this is the window glass texture, deco glass, right, in Unreal. But in Houdini, we don't have a texture for that, so it's empty. But then if we scroll down, we run into the concrete bars, further down the list, concrete panels, and finally, some of the other ones like Rough Blaster. So that's fairly straightforward. We now have it ordered. Let's give this a name. Sort by preview material. And then next, let's write a little wrangle script that's going to give us that uh, unique ID per material. For that, let's create an attribute wrangle. Let's name this one set preview ID. And in this case, I am not going to run over points or primitives. In this case, I'm going to run it over detail mode. Again, this basically makes it run only once, but you can still access all of the elements inside of your geometry, such as the primitives. So let's do that. In here, the first thing that I need to do is count how many primitives we actually have on our mesh that we need to texture. So if I look over here, we have a total of 31,522 primitives. Okay, So every one of those has a material that we want to set, except for our windows. But I still want to actually have that checkerboard texture on there. Now, the reason you're seeing the checkerboard texture here is actually a feature of Houdini 19. It's because by default, if an object has UVs and this is enabled, it will actually show you the texture space of those UVs as a very grayed out version of our standard UV texture. That's pretty useful, but in my case, it's distracting. So I'm going to remove it by clicking on this button. But OK, so over here, Let's get the number of primitives in this mesh. So I'm going to type a little comment here, get total amount of primitives, and then tab it over to keep it neat. And first I'll say integer prim count is equal to the number of primitives in our current mesh. So input zero. And then next, let's create a local variable for that um, number that we want to give to each of our materials, right? So I'm going to call this one integer current iteration. And by default, I'll give it a value of zero. And let's also give it a comment. So let's say set current 
default iteration value to zero. Okay. And then next, I want to run a loop over all of the primitives in our mesh. Now, in this case, we're running in detail mode because um, detail mode only runs once. But because we're running in detail mode, we can actually access the other iterations of our loop. You cannot do that when you're running in a primitive mode because each primitive loop is parallel to all the other ones. You cannot see them. In this case, it's linear. So we actually have the ability to access the data from the previous loop. Let's first set up this loop and then I'll show you what we're going to do with it. So first let's type create loop from primitive numbers. And to run a loop, we can type four. And then we have to provide three arguments. But in this particular context, these arguments are separated by semicolons. Just keep that in mind. The first argument is the iteration number that we want to store our current iteration in. So I'm going to type integer y for that. Just a value that we can write in our current iteration. And it will start at zero by default. And next, the second argument is a condition. Now, in this condition, we can write when our loop should stop. So in our case, I'm going to say if y is less than our current primitive count. And this condition will return a zero or one value. If the value returns zero, then the loop will stop. If it returns one, the loop will continue. So as long as y is smaller than prim count, it will keep the loop going. So basically, we have a number. Then we're going to check, is this number smaller than the total amount of primitives that we have? Now this number won't do anything unless we actually increase it. So the last entry here, this last argument, allows us to increment our number. This is basically what happens when the loop finishes. Okay, so that's at the start of the loop, that's conditioned to end it, and this one here does something to something at the end of a loop. If we type y++ plus plus, at the end of our loop, it's going to add a value of one to our iteration number which will allow this value to increase every time it runs the loop. So after, in our case, uh, about 31,000 iterations, it's going to start matching our primitive count, in which case y is no longer smaller than our primitive count. And when that happens, the loop ends. So basically this will run over every one of our primitives. Now, if you ever want to stop a loop, you can also use the break command and break will stop the loop right there if it's called. So you can put this inside of an if statement, for example, and then when that if statement is true, the loop stops as well. Okay, then next, let's go and add the current material for our current primitive that we're running over and then the one for the previous iteration. Now we can do that fairly simply. But let's create a comment first. Let's say um, check previous and current material. And then in here, um, I'm going to add a new string called kermot, current material. And in this case, I need to sample the current primitive. So we can use the primitive expression for that. Prim. We need to sample from input zero. Then the attribute I would like to grab is the um, preview material. And in this case, I can't see it because this node is erroring out because of my current script. So let me copy that quickly. So it does evaluate. It's um, this one that I want to grab, right? The entire file path. And then Let's do preview material. And then finally, we need to provide the primitive that we want to sample. Now, in this case, I can provide the iteration number. So since this will start at zero, our first loop will sample primitive zero. Then the next time it runs over, it's going to sample primitive one and so forth. So within this loop, within this block, 
this value is set to our current material path. All right, then let's do the next one, or rather the previous one. So I'm going to copy this and let's rename this one to previous material or prev if you want to abbreviate it. And then at the end where we have our iteration value, I'm just going to subtract one from that. So basically, if we have uh, iteration five, then it will grab iteration four, right? And that's then stored as this string. So if these values set next, we can then check if this material that we're currently running over is the same as our previous material. So remember that when we are looking at our materials, right? If I look at the material name for simplicity here, if we scroll down, let's say we're looking at iteration 592. Okay, this one's current material is going to look for tiling balcony tiles base color dot png. But then if it looks at the previous iteration, it will see no data at all, or basically it will see a different value. And if that's the case, then I want to increment this number here. Now, in the case we are running over um, primitive zero, since we are actually using the preview material, not the preview material name, this one will have a file path, even though there is no actual value at the end, right? It's an empty value, just a folder, but no texture. So it will still have something in there. And if we look at iteration zero, and then it tries to look at iteration negative one, which doesn't even exist, it will just grab an empty value. So basically, iteration zero is going to be seen as a different value. So it is going to increment that one and start out at iteration one. So let's write this out. Let's say if our current material is not equal to our previous material, then open up some curly brackets again. Current iteration plus equals one. So basically, if our current material is different from our previous one, it will increment it. And then at the end, all we have to do is write this back to our current primitive. We can do this using the set prim atrib vex command. And this command basically allows us to write an attribute to our geometry, to in this case, a primitive. Now we can also do that for other ones like uh, points, for example, we can do set um, point attrib or Maybe we want to set a group. We can do set um, prim group. And these commands basically allow us to write to an attribute on a point, a primitive or a vertex when you're not actually in that context. Now to do this, we need to provide it five arguments. The first one is again, the geometry we want to write it to, which is our own geometry in this case. So it's always going to be zero. Then next, the name of the attribute we want to write it out to. In this case, I'm going to create a new attribute called preview ID. Then we want to grab the primitive number that we want to write to. That's going to be our I for our current iteration, right? Our current primitive number. Next, we want to grab the value that we want to set. This is going to be our current iteration value. So this one. And then finally, we just tell it to set the attribute. Now it is possible to also toggle the attribute. If it's for example, a zero or one value, this will flip it. Um, you can read more about this in the help file if you want to know what this is capable of. But for now, this should do. Let's go ahead and execute that. And as you can see, we now have a new attribute here called preview ID. Let me just shrink this down a bit. And if I scroll down, then as we go and access new textures, new material names, it's going to increment our number. 
So that's exactly what we wanted to do, have a unique number per material. So with that set up, let me just quickly add a comment here just to keep it clean. I'm going to say um, set material ID starting at one to primitive number uh, Y. Also, maybe add a comment to our if statement as well. If material is different, add one to current iteration value. Okay, this keeps your code legible, right? It's easier for other people to understand and for you if you ever need to look back through your code this will give you a clean readout. So it's always good to add some comments to your code. You might not have to comment everything, but it does help in the end. So it's your choice. And then next, let's go ahead and set up a group. Now we can do this in two different ways. One, we create a group using the partition node, or we can create a set primitive group in here as well. So I'll show you both and then we'll use one of the two, okay? So just like before, let's first try the partition method. So in this case, we drop down a partition node and we need to set a new rule called material underscore, which is the main name of the group we're trying to create. And then inside backticks, because we need to evaluate an attribute as an expression, at preview ID. Now, if we do that, then it will create a unique group for us. So down here, we now have material one, two, three, four, five, etc., up until material 14. So that's good. That's basically what we want here. So I'm going to rename this one to partition material ID into groups. All right, so that will do. Now we don't need this partition node down here, so let's get rid of that. And before we continue, I just want to show you the alternate method, how you can do this using VEX. So instead, let's plug it in like so. Go back to our VEX node. Like I mentioned, we can also write out a group using the set prim group command. And in this case, we need to write out a group with a unique name for every current iteration value. Now, since this loop is running over our primitives, we could just do it for every primitive and then set it on itself. In this case, what I can do is instead of writing out an attribute with this value, we can write out a group with that value. To do that, we can type zero again for our current geometry output. Then we need to type the group name. In this case, that's going to be material underscore, but then this needs to actually get a number. Now we'll deal with this in a second. And then if we provide the current primitive we want to set it to, so our current iteration, we have a value of one because we do want to set the group to one if we create it. And then we can do set to make sure that it is enabled. So by doing that, we now actually create a new group called material underscore without the number. Then we still need to have that number, right? Because otherwise all this is doing is creating a group on every single primitive. Instead, let's grab this and let's write out a sprint f function, string print f. Now inside the um, quotation marks for this, we can type material underscore. And then again, we can use the percentage sign D, which allows us to write out um, a float or an integer. Then we put a second argument in there, and that's going to be our current iteration. So basically we have material underscore and then our current iteration. So what I will do is create a unique group per material 
and it will only set the value of that group to one if we are on that material. So material one for the glass, only the glass panes have group value one. It's doing the same thing as this partition node, right? Except in this case, it's doing it inside the wrangle. Now, you can use this code if you want. It's just here to demonstrate that this is a possibility. So you can start thinking about the type of options that are available to you, like what you can do with VEX. But okay, with this set up, let's move on to our material node. In this case, um, we don't need our prefix texture folder or file extension, but I do want to keep the group. I'm going to go here to prefix texture folder, right click it, and I'm going to say under more, delete spare parameter. It's going to double check and I'm going to say yes, delete. And we'll do that for the file extension as well. And then what I want to do is change the group name to material underscore one. Now I could write it down like this, of course, and that will work. This will filter out that group. However, um, that means that if I go and copy this, so we have material two, we still need to go in here and change that by hand or go to this drop down and then select it. I don't want to have to do that. Instead, let's make this group field here read out the name of our node. So when we make copies, the number on this node will increment automatically and then the group name will do the same. So up here inside backticks, we can add in here the operator name function. So the operator name or op name function can grab the name of a node. And in this case, what we want to do is grab the name of our own node. So we need to provide the address to that. We can do that with the relative address dot. What this basically does is it checks the current parameter and then dot moves it up to the node. Now, if we were to type dot dot, we actually go up into the upper network here. Now we might want to do that if we want to navigate to other nodes, but in this case we don't. We just want to grab ourselves. And that's like that. Then now this will read material one. We copy this. It will read material two. So that's pretty simple, but pretty useful. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go inside this node. Okay. So in here, we can see our group is already set up because we are grabbing it from the top of our node here, the top of this uh, subnet. But our texture is not. Now, if we look at the windows, the ones that we're currently trying to assign, uh, right now it's loading up this um, brick texture, this uh, balcony tiles texture. I don't want that. Let's get rid of that. And that will turn it blank. If there's no texture, it's just white. Now what I do want to do is actually set our current preview material path. Now we cannot do that as easily. We need to grab it from somewhere. So I'm going to grab a blast node to filter out just our current group, the group that we're trying to assign this texture to. So over here, I'm going to say isolate material. And then we need to set the group. So let's go up to the top of the node, grab the group value, and let's paste it over here as a relative reference. So with that, it's going to add it inside backticks and it's going to filter out that group. Now, in this case, I want to keep the group. So let's flip it over to delete non selected. And that will keep our current group around. Okay, so now we can sample from this our current material name and path. Now, in this case, this texture doesn't actually have a material to sample. So if we try to feed that to our quick shade, it is going to just return a blank field, just like it is doing now. So let's go ahead and retrieve that value and set it up so our quick shade can load it. I'm going to use a wrangle node again in this case. We'll see why. I'm going to plug it in and let's call this one check file type 
for file path. Now, in this wrangle node, what we're going to do is write the most complex piece of VEX code that we have written up to this point. Now, this is going to consist out of four different components plus a debug component. Let me quickly go over what we're going to write and then we'll get right into it. So over here is the VEX code that I want to write. Basically, we're first going to retrieve our current material path. So that's the full material path, the folder and the file name for the current texture we're trying to assign. And then we are going to check if this is actually a valid texture or not using an external library, which comes with Houdini, but isn't loaded by default, which will allow us to check um, file IO information. So basically if a file exists on our hard drive and we can use these commands here and we'll set that up in a minute um, to get that information. And then we are going to check for a list of extensions that we can provide um, if it's a valid extension on our file path or not. So if we look at our file, right now we are trying to load PNG files, right? Now down at the bottom, I have a little list with valid extensions. And at the moment it's trying to load only Targa files, meaning that this check here that we are setting up is gonna check if our current extension is a TGA file. And if it's not, it won't allow it to load that file. Now, this might get confusing for you as a user. So we're also gonna output a little debug command to our console if we turn on this button here. And with that, it's going to tell us this is a valid file path. However, the extension PNG is an invalid file type. So basically, we're going to get a little readout to see if the file we're trying to load is valid, if it actually exists on our hard drive, and if it's allowed to load it. Now, if we do want to make it load that file, we just have to provide it either with no extensions at all, in which case it will tell us which is an invalid file type, but the list is empty, so all extensions are valid, or alternatively, we can type in say PNG and JPEG, and then it's gonna tell us, well, PNG is valid, so we're gonna load this one. So basically this is gonna be a simple console-based readout that we can enable or disable, and we can specify what file types we want to load. This isn't necessary per se. We could skip over all of this, but I do wanna quickly show you how you can write some more complex VEX code, keep it organized, and also, because it's more complex, create your own debug output. So um, with all of that, once we have determined if our file is valid or not, we are gonna check if that's true, and if it is, then we're gonna assign our material. And we'll assign it over here in this uh, quick shade, right? Otherwise, we are gonna tell it to load the UV grid texture, the default one that comes with Houdini. So with that, let's get started. And like I mentioned, the first thing that we want to do is retrieve the current file path. And to do this, we do need to run this node in detail mode, meaning that uh, we are gonna run this code only once, but because we've already filtered out all of the models that don't have our current material, that doesn't matter. We only need to run it once because we only need to sample one of these primitives, right? They all have the same attributes in this case, so it doesn't matter. Let's go over here, set this one to detail mode. And for starters, let's set up some of the main variables that we need for this code to work. So I'm gonna type some extra comments in this field I'm gonna copy over a couple of comments from my other code on my other screen, just to um, speed up this a bit. Um, and then the first line that I want to write is get the preview material path and the file name 
um, for the current material group we are iterating over. So basically this attribute here and the preview material name attribute. Now at this moment, this glass doesn't have a preview material name. It doesn't actually have a Houdini material, right? We only have that on the rest of our building. Our glass only has the Unreal material, which I've already mentioned before. So let's go ahead and type this up first. Let's grab a string. So I'm going to type string file path. And then let's sample one of our primitives. So type prim. We want to grab it from input zero. Then I want to grab the preview material attribute. This one, right, with the full file path. And then we want to grab primitive zero. Ultimately, we will always have at least one primitive. But because we've already filtered it out using this blast node, we don't have to worry about which primitive we grab. It will all be the same. Then the next line, let's copy this, paste it in. I'm going to change this one over to file name. And we need to sample the material name in this case. So this will grab for us these uh, variables so we can load it later in our code. And then let's go ahead and block out our code. So in this case, I'm just going to use some comments to create basically a bit of organization inside of my code here. The first one is going to be for the um, file checking system. So I'm going to copy this in and this is going to say, check if the file on this path is valid using the file.h add-on library. We'll deal with that in a minute. Then the second block I want to write to is going to um, get this comment. Let's check the extension and make sure it's a file type we accept. Okay. And then the last comment is going to be for output. And this one's going to say output. If all conditions are valid, write the preview material to the file path attribute. So we're going to set this one up piece by piece. So the first thing that I would like to do is check if our file our current file that we're getting from this attribute here actually exists. And we can do that using a vex function called file underscore stat. Now it's not as straightforward as any of the other functions that we normally use. There is a help card for the file stat function. So if I look for it over here in help browser, let's say um, file underscore stat, then we can find its vex function right here. And it will tell us how to use it. However, um, this function isn't completely supported. Apparently, there is a library available to us that has a better version. So the better file stat function. Now, this one's a bit um, special. Basically, what we have to do is we first have to load an extended library for Houdini that allows us to load these file IO stats. So for that, we have to type hashtag include, which will allow us to load an external library. And then I'm going to load in the file.h library. If you do that, then from this point on below this code, that library will be accessible. Now, what I want to do with this is load two pieces of information. I want to check if my file is a file and I want to check if it's valid. Now you can check all kinds of information about your files, like if they're readable or if they're writable, like if they're read only, for example. Um, now in this case, I don't have to worry about that. Now in order to write this, it's a little bit different than how you would write it with normal VEX code, like what we've done so far. Basically this library has a slightly different format. So let's go ahead and set it up like this. So in order to check our file status, we can use, like I mentioned, the file stat function. And since we've loaded this library here, this function will now be coming from that library. So we do need to abide by its particular format. And this one's a bit special. So what we can do is we can give it the file path up here to our file. So if we give it this variable and we 
put a semicolon behind it, then it will get that file and it will check it. But this isn't as simple as writing it out to an integer, for example, because that one will fail. We also can't write it out to a string. It won't accept that either. So if it's not an integer or a string, then what is it? Well, it's actually a custom um, variable type called stat. And that one will work. Basically, stat in this case is like a string or like an integer. We can define our custom variable for it. But unlike these ones, this won't highlight purple. And that's because it's a custom variable type um, that comes from this library. And that one isn't highlighted in this editor. That's just something to keep in mind. Now, what this will do is it will store the file information, the file stat information, into this variable s. And we can then access it. And then we can go ahead and check if it's actually a valid file path and a valid file. So first, let's check if it's a valid file path. And we can do this using the if statement, s for our stat variable. And then from our help file, we can see we can use this command, dash, arrow to the right, is valid, and then function brackets. So if we copy that, paste it in here, then now this code will check if this is actually a valid file path. Now this will only check if it's a valid file path. It won't check if it's a valid file. So if you give it a folder, it will still accept it and it will still tell you this is valid. So we're also going to check this against the file as well. We could do either one, but um, I want to actually output a bit of code with it, a comment to a console. So we're going to do this in two stages. First, let's say if this is true, then we're going to check if it's also a valid file. So again, we can use s is file. And if that's true, put it in its own brackets here. Then we are going to write out a variable that says this is a valid file. So we can type valid file equals one. Now this is a local variable and we have not actually defined it yet. If you're going to define a local variable inside of an if statement, it's actually best to define it up here before you actually start using it. So I'm going to do that. Let's say integer valid file equals zero. So by default, we have this as zero. But if we go through this code and we check if it's actually a valid folder path, and then if it's a valid file path and both are true, we're going to write one into it. Okay, so that's the first system done. Now we still need to actually know if this is a valid file or not. Now we could, of course, write this out to a attribute. I could actually write here valid file equals one. And because we're in detail mode down here, it's going to tell us if this is a valid file or not. Now at the moment we are loading our glass texture, which is not actually a valid file. So it will fail on that. Now, if you want to check that, we can always go outside the node, change the name of this node to one of the other materials like material two. And if we then go inside, now it's telling us this is a valid file. So it's one, right? Now it's perfectly fine to use an attribute like this to read out if your code is working or not. In this case, it's a detail attribute, so it's even simpler. This node will only write out one attribute, a detail attribute, and it will tell us this file is valid or not. But what I actually would like to do is write out a more user-friendly console output that we can turn on and off to tell us if the folder was correct and if the file was correct as well. So instead of writing out this um, attribute here to our details, let's create that little debug system. For that, up at the top of our code, I'm gonna create a new variable, um, which will allow me to determine if we are in debug mode or not. 
let's say debug. And then I would like to have a toggle on this node, on this wrangle, that we can turn on or off. So for that, we need an integer parameter for starters. Let's type chy, channel attribute y, and I'll call this one debug. Let's expose it up here. And that will give us this integer parameter down here. I'm going to change this one to a toggle. So let's open up our parameter interface on this node. Then we can grab our debug button and switch this to a toggle. So if you have that, then now we can turn this on or off and it will store it in the debug integer attribute, either as zero or one. Simple enough. Then let's go ahead and create our debug code. So the first thing I would like to do is under the valid check for our folder. So for that, actually, let's add a comment. Let's say check if this is a valid folder path. And then in here, let's type debug if our debug command is one, then I'm going to put these brackets behind it because it's a single line. It's a bit simpler. I'm going to say print F to print to the console. And in this case, I don't have to do anything special. I just have to say is valid path. And assuming I put my semicolon in there, it's important. This should now output when I turn on debug my console. So as long as this is a valid file path, which it currently is, it will output that. Then let's grab this code, debug and the line below. And let's paste it below our valid file equals one attribute. So this might put it in the wrong line. So we just have to change the tabs a bit. And now I would like to change this comment to something that will fit behind this line. So let's delete this and let's start with a space. Then I'm going to say and file. So basically, if this is a valid file, we might need to clear this first. Toggle it on again. So if it's a valid file path and file, then it will give us this. On the other hand, if we go back to material one, now this will output for us just that it's a valid path, but because this is not true at the moment, this part, it won't output our and file print. Now we can still make it output something else instead. And we can do that by saying else. So basically, if the if statement is not true, then instead we'll run the else command, the else statement. If you want to expand this further, you can also go else if. And then it will run this one first and then that one. But else commands only happen if the statement before it was invalid. OK, so um, this way you don't have to put 10 if statements behind one another. This one will only trigger if the statement above it was false. Now, in this case, we can grab this debug command again, plug it in here, and then we can say perhaps, however, invalid file. So it will again put it behind this line so if we clear this, we can use debug again, and then it will put it correctly. So it will say is valid path, however, invalid file. Okay, that's clear enough, right? But you might have noticed that if I keep triggering this, it will put it behind this line instead of on the next line. Uh, we can fix that very simply by adding slash n to any of our commands. 
If we do that, it will put it on the next line, right? However, in this case, because this command might not always trigger, we would have to put it on every final line. I'd rather not have to do that. So instead of putting it in this line here, let's get rid of that. Copy our debug line again. And let's put it at the bottom here. Now it might space it out. So I'm just gonna correct that. And then here, I'm gonna type backslash n. So that will basically force our print to the next line. And the next thing that's gonna be printed, so the next time we run this debug, it's gonna be on the next line as well. So like this. Okay, so with this set up, um, let's set it back to a valid file so we can continue testing. I'm gonna change this back to material two. And again, it will output for us. This is a valid file and a valid path. And then next, let's actually make this work with our quick shade. Because now that we have a basic checking system and we have our file path, we can output this to our quick shade. Now we'll deal with the extension check in a minute. First, let's make this work. So over here, if our valid file variable, so this one, if this is one, then I wanted to write out my preview material attribute to a string attribute. Um, now in this case, we already have it up here. We have the file path. So I'm gonna grab that. I'm gonna call this one string at file path equals file path. Basically, um, we're gonna write this one to a detail attribute because we are in detail mode. So if we now look at it down here, you can see that in this wrangle node, if this is a valid path, it will output it here. Um, now, if we are trying to load a different texture, like if we are trying to load our windows, which doesn't have a valid file path, then instead I wanted to load the um, default texture that comes with a quick shade node. So let's drop down a quick shade node here. And inside its texture map parameter, you will find UV grid underscore gray dot pick. Copy that. And then we can put it down here. So string attribute file path becomes that. Because this is a string, we have to put it inside of quotation marks, right? So like that. So basically, if we have a valid file path, we write out whatever comes from our attribute. Otherwise, we write out this. Simple enough. So let's hook this up to our quick shade next over here in a quick shade. We want to reference our details attribute coming from this node here. So basically this file path. Let's create a spare input link. So we have that link, so we can reference it as negative one. And then under the texture map, let's type back ticks because we want to grab an expression. Um, details, because we want to read a string detail attribute, negative one, and then inside quotation, file path. If we do that, that should retrieve the path for us from this attribute. So this attribute comes in from above, from our network over here as a primitive attribute, then it gets filtered out, so we only have our current material. That's then loaded in here and converted to a detail attribute if it's a valid file path. And then we retrieve it using our quick shade, using a details expression. So now that's working, let's test it out. So over here, we can see 
under this particular material, material 2, we are loading our balcony texture. And if I switch this over to uh, a different material number, like material 1 in this case, that's for the glass, it's instead going to load that default grid texture. Because now our file is no longer valid. So valid file is 0, and it will load this instead. OK, so now we have a proper working piece of code. This will work, but I would like to go a little bit further and just also check if the extension of our file is a type we want to accept. But I don't just want to filter for one extension. I want to check for any number of extensions and if they are valid or not. So if they're in this list, they're going to be valid. Or if this list is empty, everything is going to be valid. So we can turn off this check by emptying the list, or we can filter very specific file types. So in order to make this work, we first need to have a valid texture that we're trying to load so we can test with it. Let's go back out, change this back to material two. And now down here, we do have a valid file. So that should be um, tiling balcony tiles base color dot png. First, let's go ahead and filter for the dot png. Now we can use the same trick that we used in the last video, but in this case, instead of removing dot png, I want to keep it. For that, we can use the split function again. So I'm going to type string file extension in this case, because we only want to grab the extension. And then I'm going to type split um, our file name. So in this case, I'm grabbing not the file path, but the file name, this attribute down here. Then I'm going to split it by the dots again. And then instead of filtering out the first set of elements, except the last one, I just want to keep the last element. And for that, we can use the following command, negative one, colon. And this will grab the last element from the array. Of course, you can go to the help file and look for split again. But what we have right now is basically an array with only one element in it, that being the PNG in this case, because we filtered out the dot. Um, so if I want to write this out like this, again, it will fail because we're trying to write an array, a string array into a simple string. We need to turn this back into a string before we can write it out. So to do that, um, we can use again the join feature. Now join doesn't actually need multiple elements to work. In this case, we could just join a single entry with itself. If we do that, this will turn back into a string and it will write it out. And if you want to see what exactly this is, you can just print it out, right? S at um, extension equals file extension. And here you can see it's writing out PNG, which is what we want. I'm going to comment this out. And then just to make it clear for us, let's also write out to our console what extension we're currently actually grabbing. So I'm going to grab this debug line paste it down here. And if this is true, then I'm going to say with the extension and then within brackets percentage sign s for a string variable we want to set. And then behind this, we can type file extension we do that, it will write it out like this. Now, uh, we do have that spacing issue here. So we could say behind these ones, we add an extra space. So after and file and invalid file. And then down here, I also want to add a dot in front of this um, percentage sign. 
Now we'll make sure we write it out like this. Is a valid path and file with the extension .png. It's just about the formatting, really. Uh, we want this to be legible. We don't want it to be mushed together, right? So now that we know what file extension we have, and we can see it over here, let's check against a parameter that we can set ourselves if it's a valid extension or not. So I'm going to add a comment down here. I'm going to say, um, grab a parameter from the interface and we want to split it by its spaces. And then let's first create a string parameter that we can write in which extensions are going to be valid. So let's create a string local variable. We're going to call this one extension list underscore s for string. And then um, let's say a channel string parameter reference uh, called extension list. So if we create that, it will be down there. Now, um, I do want to rename that one. So let's open up our parameter interface again. I'm going to grab this string here, put it above our debug button, and let's rename this one to um, valid extension list. And as a default value under channels, I'm going to type PNG and JPEG. So if we have that, let's click apply. That should give it to us right there. And we will have to scroll back down because we updated the interface of this wrangle. Um, it's a bit inconvenient, but that's what happens. Now, next, let's take this string here and let's turn it into an array. I basically want to grab an array of every single element separated by a space. Let's say string extension list, but in this case, I'm going to say brackets equals the split command. And we're going to run this on the extension list underscore s attribute we defined right above. Um, and I'm going to split it by a space. So within the quotation marks here, we just have an empty space. If it finds that it's going to split by that. That will create for us this array here that we can then sample from. And if we want to see what's in the array, we can, of course, again, create a test attribute. So I'm going to say S for string brackets for array at test equals extension list. Now, if we do that, it's going to create this test attribute again, detail attribute. So we can see it's PNG and JPEG in this list and then anything else I add in there. All right. And then next, what I want to do is loop over this array. So our array with our PNG and JPEG and then sample every one of them in its own loop. And we can do that using the for each function. So for each, just like the for function we looked at before, this one requires a semicolon. And the way how this one works is it requires an element to write into for whatever element we're looping over. So in this case, if we're looping over a string array, we need to provide a string local variable. Let's do that. So we can say um, extension in this case, because we are writing out an extension from the array to sample in this loop. And then we can say extension list, which is our array from here. So this is going to loop over every single entry in the array, PNG and then JPEG in this case. Now, um, I want to check if our current file extension is equal to the extension from my parameter. So let's say if file extension is equal to the extension, right? the one we currently have from our file, if it's equal to one of these, then I'm going to set valid extension to one. Again, this is going to be a local variable we're going to set. So up at the top of our code, 
where we have our variables. Let's add this one here as well. Let's say integer valid extension equals zero. So with this local variable defined up here, we can then write into it inside of our if statement, and that will work. And in case this is a valid extension, I also want to write out a debug command. So let's grab this again. Let's tab it over a bit. And in this case, I'm simply going to say dash which is valid. So if it's a valid extension, it's going to tell us that. Now, if it's not a valid extension, like if we provide something else like Targa, then it won't print anything. But I can't just put an else statement here like I did before, because this is inside of a loop. I'll show you what I mean. Let's say I type else and I'm gonna grab this debug command again. And let's say, um, which is um, invalid file type. Okay, so Targa is an invalid file type, so that's fine. But let's say I provide two invalid file types here. Um, maybe we say exe then it will print it twice because it ran through this loop twice. Twice this condition was invalid, so twice it printed out that. We don't want that, so we actually have to put this behind this for each loop. Otherwise, it will keep printing it. Um, now, it's very simple to fix. Let's grab this piece, delete this else line, and then behind our for each loop, I'm just going to check if we are actually dealing with a valid extension or not, because we do have this attribute here. So let me just change the spacing a bit. And then inside of this if statement, I'm going to say, if our debug system is turned on, and valid extension is zero. Because if it is zero, then we know that none of the file extensions were true, therefore, we should print this. See what I mean? We only output one line. And with that, we can also add it down here to our valid file if statement. In this case, I'm going to say if it's a valid file and if it's a valid extension, so our valid extension attribute, then we set the file path. Otherwise, we do the default texture again. Um, now, there's one more thing I want to do. So let's say we empty this list. Again, it will think it's an invalid file type because um, there's no file type to check against. This will never be true. In this case, I'm going to give it a valid pass at all times. Now, to do that, I'm going to write a comment here. In case no extensions are provided, ignore this check and set it to always valid. So I'm going to say if my extension list here is completely empty, then um, we're going to set the valid extension to one. So let's grab this variable. If this is equal to a string with no data, so basically like that then valid extension equals one. Now it's still going to output this line here, but then I want to add something to it. So let's copy that line, put it down below. And then here I'm going to say, but the list is empty. So all extensions are valid. And because I copied it from this line, we do need to remove this part from the if statement down there. Otherwise, it will check against that and then it will not work. 
Okay, so here we go. Is a valid path and file with extension .png, which is an invalid file type because we never defined it. But the list is empty, so all extensions are valid. Now, if you don't want this to be put behind that line, you can also grab this section here, copy it, and then we can say, else, if it's not empty, then we can check against this. So in this case, we are only uh, writing out which is an invalid file type if um, we don't have an empty string, like that. Okay, so everything appears to be working. Yep, and with that, we are pretty much done with this VEX code. This will allow us to debug it. So if you're gonna write more extensive VEX with multiple if conditions, it can be helpful to, for your own benefit, um, create a debug system. It takes a bit of extra time, it's not completely necessary, but it will allow you to understand what your code is doing without having to write it out to um, test attributes all the time. Okay. Now with that, um, we are pretty much ready. We have our system operational, so I'm going to turn off the debug command, or this one will constantly output these lines of debug code. So only turn this on when you need it, right? You don't want this popping up every single time you compute your tool. And then we can go outside and we can start copying these. So I'm going to start at one for our glass texture. Let's grab this node, plug it in below. So we get number two and that will automatically assign it to the second group. So material two, we can copy this one again. That will assign the next two. And then we can just keep copying this until we have about 20 or so. Now, in this case, I'm just going to do it like this. Copy this batch. And then paste it in twice more. Then we just have to plug it up. Now, if you have more of these, then you have textures. That is fine. It will not be able to find a group to assign a texture to. So the quick shade inside these will have nothing to find and it will have no group to assign to. There is no material 24 group on our geometry. So this quick shade isn't going to do nothing. Let's make sure we plug it up to the end node. And with that, we now have all of our textures reassigned. Um, you will have to copy these nodes by hand because they are just subnets. They are not digital assets. If you do want to, you could turn them into a digital asset, but that means you have more assets to manage. So keep that in mind. And there's one more thing. These materials are always trying to look for that attribute. I have noticed that Houdini can still try to look for that attribute, even if this is not the main node. In fact, if I were to grab these nodes and snip this line, it might actually freeze up Houdini. I think that's a bug. Um, you can simply render out the nodes and then disconnect the line. That will work. I'm not sure why this is breaking in Houdini. I'm not sure why that would cause Houdini to freeze, but it's something to be aware of. So let's go back outside this node and let's set up the last bit. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. So at this point, um, we could still load this tool back into Houdini 18.5. We haven't introduced any non-compatible nodes as far as I'm aware. So let's add a switch that will allow us to flip between these different texturing styles. So if we are using Houdini 18.5 with this asset, uh, we can still use that compatible texturing mode. Otherwise, we can use the Houdini 19 version. So let's go and add a switch and let's call this one um, texture compatibility mode. And then to finish it up, um, let's hook this up to our interface so we can switch it there. 
I'm going to open up my type properties, make sure I have the switch selected. And then down below where we have our setup tab, let's look for our material section, like over here. Let's drag it in. And let's make this a ordered menu. And let's call this menu texture compatibility mode. Like so. Then under its menu tab, I'm going to add zero as Houdini 18.5. And value one is going to be Houdini 19. All right. And now I'm going to set this one to zero by default, because if we were to load this up in Houdini 18.5, I do want it to work. Otherwise, we can always switch it to Houdini 19 as we need to. You can do what you want with this, actually. So let's accept that. And then with that, under our output, You won't see much of a difference because ultimately we are loading the same textures. However, if we go to one of the windows and we switch it to Houdini 19 mode, we do have that grid texture. So you can see that the switching method works and this should work in Houdini 18.5 and Houdini 19. Okay, so with that, um, we've pretty much finished up this tool. So let's go ahead and test it out in Unreal one last time. Make sure we have the last node rendered. Our entire network looks fine. Let's save it out. And then here in Unreal, let's go to our foundation building tool. Let's re-import it. And then for this occasion, let's go ahead and draw a new building using a this tool. So let's drop it down. What I would like to do is quickly set up a building, bake it out and give it some custom textures. Now I'm not going to be too fancy about this. We'll just do this quickly. So let's click on it. We can drag, of course, and draw a new building. And if we hold the Alt key, then we can quickly add some new sections. I mean, at this point, you've probably already done this a few times, so this shouldn't be a surprise. But you might notice that the tool gets a bit slow. And that's because if you haven't enabled the compiling system, then of course, as your building gets bigger, it's going to take more time to compute. So I'm going to turn on compiling under setup. And if I do that, the tool will become a lot faster. So I'm going to quickly draw a simple shape, uh, nothing too complex. And then next, um, let's add some elevators and staircases. So let's go to the setup tab. We can scroll down, add some curve inputs for those. So first let's place down an elevator. I suggest you move the control point to the roof. So it's easier to position it on your grid. And I'm going to put it somewhere there. And let's do the same thing for our staircase. Let's put it over here, perhaps. All right, maybe a bit up over there should do and then let's configure the building a bit so i'm going to make it slightly taller let's say we make it a uh, seven floors tall and of course we can change the layout of our balconies now in this case let's say i space the balconies out a bit more that lines them up nicely so actually i like that let's keep this and then if you're happy with this building we can go ahead and um bake it out. So before we bake it out, I'm going to hide my visualizer or that will be another component visible on the building. I'm going to go over to my setup tab and let's hide it. And then we can click on bake. And when we do that, 
it will generate a new mesh for us and we can grab it. It should already be selected by default and move it out of the way. So this is a fully baked version of our building. It comes with different components. Uh, we have the main mesh over here. Inside of it, it should already be assigned its collision mesh as well. And the meshes should now be located in your bake folder. So if we go over here, our main building shape is now located in our bake folder. Now, if you're still dealing with the Houdini 19 bug, then you'll also have to set your collision complexity to uh, use complex collision as simple, or our building will not have a working collision and we'll just walk straight through it. Hopefully that gets fixed soon enough. And apparently in this version, there's another bug with collision. Now this one might still be located in your temp folder, even though we baked it out. It's actually located here. So you might have to copy this one into your bake folder or whatever folder you want to use, just to keep it in mind. Now let's customize this building a bit. Let's say we want to apply some of our own materials. So if we go to the top, we have all of our material slots right here. And because I've diversified the amount of textures we have on this building, uh, we can do quite a bit with it. So let's go to the content browser, go to materials. And if you've downloaded version 1.1 of the example files, then you should have the additional textures as well. So I'm gonna grab my brick texture here. I'm gonna replace this red brick with that. That looks quite nice. And let's also switch out um, the windows as well. So the windows do have UVs, so this should work. If you go down to the bottom, I'm gonna grab maybe this one for the bottom windows. That's the deco glass instance right there. Now these are not transparent, but it does give the building a nice look. And then I'm gonna grab this one for those. Okay. So this is how you can customize your buildings and how you can go ahead and create, like for example, some of these. So feel free to experiment. You can change the layout of the balconies, um, maybe even remove them all together if that's suitable for your building. And with that, you could go ahead and basically build yourself a little city. So at this point, we've covered everything that I want to teach you in the foundation module. Now this module was mainly about teaching you the basics of Houdini, how to follow through a full project and learn some of the skills that you'll need to make your own Houdini tools. I mean, at this point, we've covered how to create your own custom tool for the Unreal Engine, including modeling, texturing, collision setups. We've also covered instancing and how to generate our own instances and models, how to generate a model in Houdini and then instance it in Unreal automatically. We've also covered optimization and how we can work around bugs. So that's a lot of information already. Now this is only the first module of this masterclass. And if you liked the content that I've presented so far, there is more to come with the first paid module of the masterclass to be released in this coming year. And this one will include the elevator and the staircase module. But I will also be releasing more free content over the course of this next year as well. I have several things lined up and all of this is made possible thanks to the support of my patrons. So if you've been enjoying this video course so far and you want to see more free content, then supporting me on Patreon is a great way to get that done because it tells me you want to see more of content like this. And of course, if you've finished your project and you want to show it off, um, feel free to go to the Eudini Academy Discord channel and show your projects there. I always love to see what you guys made. And of course, leaving a comment or a like on this video also greatly helps out the channel. Now, at the end of this video, I'll give you a link to the preview for the next module of the masterclass, which will involve elevators and staircases. And if you want to stay up to date on that, 
You can also, of course, go to the eodiniacademy.com website. I'll be updating this one shortly with new information about module two. Or you can subscribe to the mailing list here at the bottom. So thanks for watching this video series. It's been quite an adventure. I love interacting with you guys on the Discord channel um, and there will be more to come. So I hope to see you out there and for the rest, have a good one.